Oxford, 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 Oxford,
clone it. Okay, this is, this is totally abstract, nothing to do with quantum theory here at all. And if we have an erasing operation. Oh, that. <laughs> okay. Um, oops, come on. Furthermore, if I have uh, my erasing map, of course, it will accept one thing and it will erase it. Okay. So those two are obvious. The the other two have a, an interpretation also. So the adjoint of the the cloning map is a kind of a comparison. It will pass its inputs if they're the same. Otherwise, it will fail. And the other one is a preparation of something which is, um, you know, contains no information compared to the, the, uh, the state space. That's a bit nebulous, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, so here's the algebraic laws. So this is saying that the, uh, the delta is a cohomonoid, it's associative, uh, it's commutative, and here it's saying that the epsilon is the unit for the monoid, uh, so the co unit for the cohomonoid. So if I put it in one side, it's the identity. If I put it into the other side, it's the identity. And if I read the whole picture the other way around, it makes it a commutative monoid. Okay, that's very simple. And this is the other condition. Uh, I forget which one of these is which, but essentially if you have the, the cloning and then you, you co-clone one of the clone things, then you get the same thing as if you, you compared <laughs> and then cloned. And this is kind of uniformity condition saying that if you clone something and then test that they're equal, well, it's the same thing as if you did nothing. Okay. Uh, but if you look back through all of these equations, what you're seeing is a lot of equations which essentially will destroy the topology of whatever diagram you've drawn here. And that gives you what's called the spider theorem. And briefly stated, it says if you make any, any diagram from these delta epsilon maps and their adjoints, then all you need to know about that diagram is the number of inputs and the number of outputs. And everything else is, is, is fixed just by these, this data. Okay, so we have this nice graphical calculus, but then it turns out to be fairly um, uninteresting on account of this, this quite powerful theorem. What should be connected? Oh, yes. Sorry, yeah, it should be connected. Yeah, that's right. For this one, I think not, but I need to check. I think it's, it's, that's just as it is. Dusko's shaking his head, so I assume that's true as stated. Okay. There, is, there are going to be some numerical factors arriving in the next part. Okay, so that was abstract. That was just ax abstract axiomatics. So let's try and think of what we can do to achieve this in the quantum setting. So, as was mentioned, we can define a delta map like this one, which is going to take a qubit in its standard basis and just map it to two copies of itself, okay? And so this delta Z is the cloning map for the, the basis of eigenvectors of the Pauli Z operation. So clearly, it's not going to clone every state. In particular, if we put it in this plus state, we'll get the Bell state out, okay? But an interesting point is we're talking about quantum states rather than just vectors in a linear space. So we can squash the global phases. So these guys are also clone. Or, or we could think of that as the cloning map is introducing a phase in some of its components as well. And it will still clone the same set of, of basis vectors. So maybe it's better to think of delta as not as cloning a basis, but a fixing an observable in the space, which is to say as fixing some axis on our, our block sphere. Okay, so that's the cloning, erasing. How do we erase a state? If, we, if I already told you it's in my, my preferred basis, my preferred way to embed the classical data into this quantum state space, what's the way I would erase it? Of course, I pick a measurement which will give me no information about the original state. Uh, and, and then even if I look at the outcome of the measurement, I didn't learn anything about what it was before I measured it. Okay, so what does that mean if I take my state? I pick some basis bi to be the, the uh, the basis of, the, sorry, the spectrum of the measurement. And I asked that my probability of observing any outcome be equal regardless. And so what that boils down to is asking that whatever my basis embedding the classical values is, then I want to do a measurement in a basis which is unbiased with respect to it. So just the idea of wanting to erase information in a quantum state space, even if you know the classical coding means you're starting to talk 
it's very naturally a mutually unbiased basis. So for that, if you're in finite dimensions, this means that the, the inner product of, the, of all the pairs of basis vectors is just the square root of the dimension. Okay? So I'm asking if I measure this, this state, psi, in my basis B, then every outcome is equally probable. That's what it means. Okay, so let's, let's have a think, let's go a little bit further with this one. Let's take this, the standard basis, and then we think about these maps epsilon with alpha, which is gonna send it, um, it's gonna project this state onto one and everything else onto zero. What we get is this is gonna give a uniform erasing for everything here because you'll get, uh, sorry, is that again? This will give the uniform erasing for these, these basis vectors if you take the minus sign here as well. And so that's effectively picking another line through the equator of your block sphere, right? However, that's not quite enough. So if we just take an arbitrary value of alpha and then put it in this composition here, which is composing it with the, the cloning map I just mentioned, in general, we're gonna get this phase map, this Z map. So unless I choose my alpha to be zero, this won't give a classical object. Of course, I could, if I really, really want this one to be my erasing map, I could put the phase back into the delta, but not so interesting. Okay, so for these two choices, this is gonna give the cloning map for this basis, and this is gonna give uniform bleeding of this. Okay, so between these two things, they give a, an embedding of some kind of classical idea of data into this quantum state. But, it's not unique. So we can also take, that was the basis for the, the basis for the Z Pauli matrix. We could also take the X basis, which consists of all these states, the plus and the minus states. And so we have a, a delta map cloning these and an epsilon map, which is just the projection uh, from zero. And again, I'll just use red dots to denote these same things. And these will obey all the same laws I just, I just showed you. But these things enjoy a special relationship, of course, the, uh, this, this vector here is one of the ones which is cloned by the green basis, but is also the, uh, the, the erasing map, sorry, the adjoint of the erasing map here, so, uh, and vice versa. So everything which is cloned by one occurs here, and everything which is cloned by the other uh, occurs in the red color. So if I move on to that, I'll make that a bit clearer. So what I have is this. If I have my green one and I put in a red state into it, it can be cloned. If I have my red cloning and I put my green uh, unbiased state into it, it's cloned. And then I have this more interesting law. This thing, if I, uh, if I arrange this configuration of maps, then I have this equation. So if I have two cloning things being co-cloned by the other color, I get the, this configuration, which states essentially that the two classes of classical objects form a uh, bialgebra. And one further thing is that if I take the scale, the inner product of one with the other, then I should get the square root of the dimension. So this circular thing is what you might have seen in uh, Sampton's talk as taking the trace of something, just the trace of the identity. So it's the dimension map. Okay. So I, I kind of lied in the previous ones. There was a scalar factor in, the, in this, these uh, bialgebraic laws. So if I'm, I'm gonna collapse my, my inner products to look more like inner products. And so this is the full set of equations which these things um, obey. All right, so let's do a quick little proof. If I start with this, this one, this bialgebra law, then I can have that's it here, I can start adding things on on either side. And using my spider law, I can reduce it to here. And I can straighten that out to give this one. And on the other side, I have the red one going into green, so it will be cloned like that. And the same on this, I uh, use spider law here. And then the same one on the green, it should, uh, sorry, sorry, spider law here, one in, one out. So that's just the identity again. And I straighten that. And so I get this. And uh, one more step. And so if you're good at reading these diagrams, what you can see is that this is actually stating that it's not just a bialgebra, but it's something more like a Hopf algebra. But we would have, usually the antipode of the Hopf algebra would be 
in here, but this is in fact just a scalar multiple of the identity. So we can write it like that. Okay. Now, so I'm going to start to show you some kind of uh, useful quantum circuit type con um, calculations we can do using this, but let's just try and sort out a few little things here. So because I have associativity, these two things are, are sorry, these, these two things are just equal, just by definition. So that doesn't, so it means if I write down this guy, it doesn't matter which way I write him. So I can write him as this H-shaped chap here. And so it, this starts to look more like a circuit notation, but, but of course all the lines here are in fact uh, of the same type, of the same nature. So this is something with one in and two outs, one in and two outs, but the temporality isn't important. Okay, so this is, again, not unlike the usual circuit notation. These are all the same kind of things. Okay, so here's an example of something we can write down. You can check by calculation that this is indeed giving the usual C0 gate. So the red dot is the uh, target qubit of the C0. And so here's a cute example you can do. Three C naughts in a row, where you switch the target over in the middle. Um, you can go through this. We're putting some twists in. Okay, and now this part in the middle is the same as our bialgebra configuration. So that can be simplified to that. And then we can use the spider law on both sides to get this. And the law which uh, stated this is the Hopf algebra to remove that spider law on these guys. And we just had to swap. Okay, so I missed out the scalar factor, so there should be a scalar factor here as well. But what you see is just from these uh, relatively simple laws, you got quite a, a significant topological change in our circuit here. Okay, so we have these two classical structures, and I would like to uh, relate them. So the map which does this, as everyone knows, is this Hadamard map. So it has a nice properties that it's self-adjoint and unitary. So self-adjoint means I don't really have to care which way up I write it, and unitary means that I have this equation. And the more interesting property it has it, I can actually define the cloning and the erasing for the X basis in terms of the H map and the Z basis. This is just elementary stuff. Okay, so that's the same picture again, but this gives rise to a general uh, color duality between the red and the green thing. So if I have any picture with, with red, I can have the same thing in green also just by exchanging the colors. And also it gives me a, an equation for changing the color variant dots just by inserting Hadamard maps, okay? So here's another uh, one of our logic gates. This is the control Z. Again, this, you can read from the picture that this is a symmetric gate. And what do we know about it? Well, this is the equation I'm trying to prove. Here's the, uh, the composition. I unify my green dots. I pull my H through like this, I get a red one, and I use my Hopf law, spider law, and then h squared is the identity, so this disappears. And you can do lots more things like this. 1D cluster state, used uh, as a, a, a key operation for measurement-based quantum computing. One way to, to prepare it is by taking a bunch of qubits prepared in this plus state like this, and then do CZ operations between them. Another way to prepare it <coughs> is to start with some of these entangled states, which are like this, which end up being denoted by these things, and use a fusion operation, which is the, uh, the adjoint to the, to the cloning. Okay, but if you write these things down in the same picture, you can see that these are the same thing. So there's a proof just by writing down the two definitions that they're equivalent. Oh, sorry, I have to use the spider law to collapse these green dots into one, that's all. All right. So something that I mentioned earlier on was that if I had uh, the configuration and I put in here the state, um, this one, as an input, then I would get the, this, this phase map. So I can, I can enunciate the principle says I'll just collapse these things together. Then I'll have a map through here which is the phase for alpha, okay? And I'll just add that to my calculus. And I can get, by my duality, I'll just have a red version of the same thing by conjugation with Hadamard gate. And you could, some things we already know about this is, of course, if you have two phases in, in sequence, then you have the, uh, the summation of the two things. 
And you can derive from this definition and the associativity and commutativity of the cloning map that these equations must hold. Or to put it in, in the more usual categorical notation, that it doesn't matter if you do z and then delta or then delta then z for only on one side. It's, again, delta is not natural with respect to z. And again, with all these, you can see that if whenever I have some, some con um, combination of alphas and, and empty dots, which is, of course, just a zero, <coughs> then I can pull all the alphas through to one point and sum them back up. So I might as well have it as a generalized spider. So I can sum all these things modulo 2 pi. OK, so we can do a little bit more. This is another measurement-based quantum computing, another example. And so what this shows is that if I prepare, I prepare some qubits in the plus state, I entangle them with CZ operations, then I do some measurements. So I'm just assuming my measurements all give me the plus one eigenstate, just to make things simple here. And so this is going to give me the, um, a general one qubit unitary given by its Euler decomposition here. OK, so we can prove this program, which is due to Danos, Kashefi, and Panagadin, is correct. Very trivial. Okay, so I just remove the boxes, simplify the picture. I use my spider law. Then I start to remove these ones because they don't need to be there because they're just one in, one out. H squares to itself. And then I have a beta surrounded by Hadamard gates, so I can just change it to red. And that was the definition. So this is an almost trivial proof of the correctness of that program. Okay. So I think about my generalized spider. What's this one, remember, is, this, is the, um, the state zero, the preparation of the state zero. So if I act on it with uh, an x, this poly x gate, I get the state one. So x in my, old, in my notation is a red pi. So that's what that looks like. And what do I know from this is that if I use a, a, a phase or a z phase on the zero, I, of course, I just get the same thing. And if I use z phase on one, I get this global phase, which I can ignore. So that's cancelled out as well. OK. And I can use, uh, I can prove some other, use that to prove some other equations, like the fact that if you have a cloning map with an alpha on it, then it's still a cloning map for the green thing. And, and I can prove that if I have phases in my vertices, I still have my hop law here. OK, so what did, what did I just show there? I showed that I had, if I have my x pi, I can do a negation for my red classical values, right? The x pi is a negation for that. What, what does that mean? It means that x is a classical operation for this classical structure, which means that it, the delta map is natural with respect to it, right? And so. So my other classical values can just pass through the, the cloning. More interestingly, if I have a phase, then this logical negation for x, just by the right calculation, gives an arithmetic negation for the phases in the green structure. OK, and I'm going to put all these little gadgets together in one, um, one more example. So here's one more gate I just wanted to show you, control the phase gate. Um, but this, at the moment, it looks like it's a very complicated, messy bunch of axioms. But um, if I have enough time, and I might not, I'll show you the sort of rational reconstruction of all this. Five minutes? OK. So the example I want to show you was the, uh, the quantum Fourier transform. OK, so this is a very important quantum algorithm. The main thing you need to notice is that if you take some inputs here in these, these basis states, you'll cut these other ones out. So I'm going to show a two-bit, two-qubit example of that. So here's one. Here's your input state, Hadamard. Control phase with these angles, Hadamard. I'll take away the boxes. And then we can just, by applying these rewrite rules in a very simple fashion, compute what it does. So I think I start here. No. I start here. So this is a classical value for green. So it goes through. It's cloned. OK, I can collapse all these, these points down. So now this can come through, becomes green. This can come through here because you, know, you can't, it's already zero, it's not affected. And spider law sums these up. 
it comes through, but it takes, you know, it takes a negation to a positive thing. So you sum up, and then this one can come through because green. And this is, in fact, the, the encoding of the thing that I showed you 10 slides ago, whoever it was. <laughs> Here, right? That's the value. Okay. Um, so uh, I haven't worked out the equations, but of course you could in fact extend these symbolic expressions with variables and start to do more calculations here as well. Okay, so this was very concrete, but this is kind of showing that you have these incompatible observables in the sense I've explained. You have this Hopf algebra structure and that you can do lots of things with, uh, with quantum mechanics, well maybe not lots of things, but this is, this is giving you something fundamental about quantum mechanics. A particular thing to note, Samson mentioned in his talk that you can do, you, the category of relations, for example, is an example of a dagger compact category and so on. The category of relations and no category like the category of relations, whatever that means, has two incompatible observables in this sense. Um, I don't know how to formalize that properly, but every derived category based on rel has only one classical structure in it. So there's a theorem which we could try and state and prove in the next hour if you want. Um, and these axioms I've shown are sufficiently strong to derive the properties of these quantum logic gates and so on. Which one? Oh yeah, but this is, uh, okay. So the Speckens time model is a counterexample, but it's a subcategory of rel. It doesn't have the whole of rel in it. So that's another interesting one, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave this up, but I'm not going to talk about it. Do I have to a couple of minutes? Okay. So let me try and show you a kind of an abstract reconstruction of what was maybe not very clearly presented in that talk. If I can find a big enough bit of chalk. So we're going to take some dagger category C. And I'm going to ask that C has this classical structure as I showed. And I'm going to also ask that in here there's a, a family VI of points such that this, this map delta uh, will clone these points. There's no button here. Uh, great. Okay. Okay, so what does this... Do I have colors of chalk? Okay, let's try and do it with two colors. So I have... If I have my... My eye... Going in here, what I want to see is that it's been cloned. Okay. And let's have the same, and we'll have the erasing here as well to say it's mutually unbiased, and that wants to say something along the lines of, if I have this, oh no, this one's red. If I have this two times, and that should give me the dimension, okay? And we'll ask for the dual to hold also. So we'll have a red cloning map a red erasing map, I will have a family WI of the white ones which are cloned in the same sense, right? And so what I'm going to ask for is that I'm going to have a group operation. And which way does it go? Yeah, here. So if I put my, my WI in here, I'm going to get a, a mapping, which is a, forms a group. Of course, so one of these values is the erasing one, so this will be the identity of the group. Or it could just be a monoid. And that this operation will act as a permutation on these guys. And that'll give you, that gives you everything that you need to see this one. So you take these your classical structures and with some... Uh, you also ask a generalized spider law, something like this. With your group operation. So in the, what I just showed you, your group operation is the Z phase. And 
but you can generalize this to three operations, then you get the phase on two components rather than just on one component. Your group operation then is the pointwise sum. This permutes the, uh, the eigenvectors of the um, permutation maps for these guys. Okay, that didn't make any sense. I'll stop. Thank you very much. Uh, well, it, it has this, uh, it does have an antipode, which is an, not an interesting one, but it's the scalar multiple of the identity, right? So you get something. So I don't, I don't study Hopf algebras very much, or at all, in fact. So I could be uh, walking on air here. But uh, what, what the difference is between what we call the Frobenius structure and what I call the Hopf structure is that this Frobenius one is coming from the same color of operations. You have the cloning and its adjoint, as opposed to the uh, when you have the two colors. So you have the bialgebraic thing. In fact, you have a quote, which you might even call a dagger bialgebra, because it doesn't matter which way up or down you read this picture. What do you mean by measuring? Sorry. Right, but this, yeah, because I mean, th there's really like four operations hiding in this picture, not just two. So it's, yeah. Thank you.